Well, it's uh, wonderful to be here in uh, beautiful Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Almost didn't make it. Flew on this plane. We were coming into the airport last night in the middle of the blizzard. And uh, the plane started to land. And then at the last minute, the pilot uh, pulled up. I haven't had that happen to me before. But uh, I was just hoping he wasn't going to run into the ocean and try to, 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 to ditch at sea. But uh, we finally made it in. And uh, it's beautiful. I, uh, this is my second visit out this way in all the years I've been in Canada. But uh, gorgeous countryside, Nova Scotia. It's a lovely place. Um, it's really wonderful to be here, too, because uh, I get to see my old colleague, uh, Craig, and uh, some of you have gotten to know and love him or know and loathe him if you've had to take one of his courses and he's put you through the ringer, probably. One of the things that you uh, might not have known about Craig was that he's actually, uh, he had a number of hobbies back west. I don't know if he's carried them out here, but one of his hobbies was horseback riding. And uh, the tale is told... Uh, that uh, back at Trinity, when Craig was leading the religious studies department back there, in fact, that um, once he, he came to class and, and uh, he almost didn't make it to class because he had had an accident where he had been fallen off a horse and was being dragged. And, uh, and then Jenny went in and got the manager of Walmart and he came out and unplugged the machine. <laughs> and so... Craig wasn't as badly hurt as he could have been. Um, again, my special thanks to uh, Dr. McDonald for uh, his uh, invitation uh, to share some of my experience and uh, what little bit of knowledge I might have to, to give to you today uh, in the next couple of days. It's uh, wonderful to see such a great uh, turnout here. It's great to have uh, representatives from the wonderful organizations such as AA and NA and Overeaters and all those uh, terrific folks who have done so much to try to make available um, that particular path for recovery because uh, we, we know that uh, the issue of addictions is, is a big issue and it's a hidden issue and for many years uh, there was not much help available for anybody and we still need all the help we can get and all the different kinds of help we can get and I hope that one of the results of our time together um, talking about addictions in the church this week is that you'll get a vision for what kinds of help are possible and what things you could do that you might not have even thought about um, and how you could participate in various types of helping to reach those who are struggling with the, the, the terrible difficulty and burden of addictions. So um, as we, I should say to you a couple of things about myself that uh, how did I get into this topic in the first place? I first encountered addictions when I was a youth pastor in New Jersey for a number of years. And uh, I was invited to participate in some interventions that <coughs> involved some church members. Um, and in fact, one, uh, one of the kids that I had had in my youth group growing up, uh, later when he was in college, he began to have trouble with drugs and alcohol. And finally, his parents said, we, we have to do an intervention on him because he's hooked on cocaine. So we began to participate in that. We began to observe as a youth pastor the role of substance abuse uh, in young people. And I wouldn't say it was rife in that particular congregation, but it was certainly happening behind the scenes and was uh, a place to be greatly concerned about in young people's lives. As I went on, I had the opportunity to work in a psychiatric institute and a number of other places uh, where I taught the family program uh, uh, for some time, which, all, which ministered to the families of patients but also many of those patients were afflicted with some kind of dual diagnosis involving a substance abuse problem. And so as, as life went on, I began to get more and more interested in the world of substance abuse and what I could do uh, to make a difference there. Um, the one uh, proviso I'll share with you is I don't happen to particularly have had uh, an addiction in my own past. I, I'm not a person who would say uh, I'm in recovery per se. Um, I would put it a different way, though, and the, the assumption I have is that everybody is struggling in a fallen world and that, um, in my view, addictions are simply a way that's emerged for a person to try to handle their problems. I've had problems, too. I've been out of work. I've been depressed. I've been on antidepressants. I've had struggles in my marriage. I've had problems, too. I haven't had that. I didn't take that route to deal with them, but I took my own flawed route to deal with things at times, too. So I see everyone who's a human being, who's living and breathing, as struggling together with this fallen world we live in and trying to come to terms with it. And uh, it's from that basis that, uh, just as the scriptures teach us, that we are all equal at the foot of the cross. Uh, addictions are just one more manifestation of the general struggle we all have as fallen human beings living in a fallen world 
and trying to reconnect with our Heavenly Father who has put us on this planet. Um, and so, uh, if you, uh, hopefully you all have an outline of tonight's uh, material. It's in your um, <clears throat> folder, I believe. If you haven't seen it, I will probably be talking quite rapidly because it's a lot of material to cover. And so, uh, we will try to, to gallop through this as, as best we can. And then at the end, I believe there's some plan to have a little bit of interaction around the discussion for the evening. Well, first of all, why should Christians even care about substance abuse and other addictions? And uh, the first thing I put on your outline briefly is that Jesus calls us to bring hope to the helpless. Uh, Jesus often reached out to people who seemed to have intractable problems. Uh, many times it was represented by physical ailments like blindness or paralysis. Um, but by analogy, folks who are suffering with addictions also suffer a kind of spiritual blindness and often believe that they're paralyzed and frozen where they are, and that there's not much hope, and they don't think they can change. And so they need the message of the transforming power of Jesus Christ and God's grace in their lives to call them out of that hopelessness, just as Jesus reached out to many hopeless folks. A second reason that we should be concerned about is that Jesus was often willing to deal with messy people who had problems. You know, in Matthew 9, uh, verses 9 through 13, you see Jesus at the call of Matthew, and he sits down at Matthew's house and he has dinner with the tax collectors and sinners. And he's immediately criticized by the Pharisees, the straight-laced religious types. And um, his reply is, he says, these are the people I've really come for. These are the people I really care deeply about. And so Jesus is willing to spend time with people who might not have looked quite as good as somebody who was dressed up and ready to go to church or had been doing some really good things, so actually they were taking care of their health and taking care of their responsibilities. Jesus loved those people too, but he was willing to get down with folks who had messy lives, who had difficulties, who had loose ends, where there weren't any simple answers maybe. A third reason why I think Christians ought to be concerned about addictions and willing to help out is that the church is the body of Christ. We have brothers and sisters who are struggling with addictions. It's not something that happens just outside someplace to those other people. It happens to those who are sitting in the pews with us. And, in fact, quite even more frequently, it's happening to the children or the nieces or the nephews or the grandchildren of somebody who's sitting next to us. Um, many pastors can tell you, too, that they've had a child who's run off the rails and has maybe gotten involved with drugs or alcohol in a way that's been really damaging. Um, lots of Christian men today struggle, particularly with the advent of the Internet, with addiction to pornography. And we know that gambling addiction is growing. It's less of a problem than some other types of addiction. But it's still a serious social problem. And there's still folks who are in the Christian community who are struggling with that just like anybody outside the Christian doors. And so it's not only those folks outside. It's also people inside. And we have a special responsibility as believers to support one another. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also so through Christ our comfort overflows. And so it's absolutely essential that we be willing to reach out to our brothers and sisters and other troubled family members. And then fourthly, when people make dramatic positive changes from an addiction, it encourages others spiritually. And so that's the payback that we get. It reminds you of the step 12 a little bit, um, which speaks about having uh, had a, a revolution in one's life, that you take the lessons that you've learned from the, the recovery walk of the, the other 11 steps, and you take that to other people. And that altruistic motive is a blessing to yourself as well. Well, the same thing is true for us as believers. We know that, that we look at Jesus' ministry again, and we see that when Jesus had that um, discussion with that lovely but very complex and uh, distorted lady, the woman at the well in John 4, that the result of that conversation that he had with that woman, who had so many problems and complexities in her life, was that when she came to faith, she went back to the town she was from, and she said, this man's told me everything I've ever known. And it had a revolutionary impact, not just in her own life, of turning her around, but it helped many other people find Christ. And so it is when God works miracles in people's lives by helping them work out and come out 
from the world of addiction. It becomes a blessing and a testimony to his power and reminds us of how God is really active. He's not just up in our heads, not just theoretical, but he is an experiential God uh, that's still walking with us just as Jesus walked with the people during his day. So how do addictions impact people when we think about them in the church and in society in general? And there's a number of ways that people are impacted negatively um, by the problem of addictions. I'm going to just scroll through. Well, uh, first of all, let's think about individual impacts. Um, the amount of admissions to emergency rooms is extraordinarily high due to substance abuse. One of the greatest problems in addition of chronic medicine today can be tied back directly to addictive processes. We think particularly about alcohol. The most damaging addictive substance anybody uses is clearly alcohol because of the systemic effects, which over time yield uh, disastrous effects on your liver, blood pressure, cardiopulmonary problems, and it's tied to a much greater risk for cancer. A huge percentage of long-range health care in this country, as well as a shortening of the mortality rate for most adults, can be tied directly back to chronic alcohol abuse. The costs for that, furthermore, are enormous in terms of the amount that has to go into the health care system to help pay for the care of those who have struggled with an addiction and reliance on alcohol. In addition to that, you can see that across the spectrum of other problems, we think about the health problems related to crystal meth, for example. How many of you read about crystal meth in the news recently or seen an article or television program? There's numerous health problems related to that. Some of the impact on the individual health-wise would be things like if you inhale crystal meth consistently, it's going to erode the enamel on your teeth. And so, typically, a chronic user of meth is going to have terrible teeth. They'll start rotting out because of the corrosive nature of the gases that are produced when you smoke it. When you think about the kinds of ingredients, which is uh, plumbing-related ingredients, other household uh, types of um, acidic substances, it eats up the inside of a person's mouth. It also affects their uh, <coughs> esophagus and their stomach lining over time as they continue to inhale. We know that if you snort cocaine continually, obviously it breaks down the membranes in your nose. Uh, furthermore, you get uh, reactions to things like crystal methamphetamine or cocaine, uh, which, is, uh, which requires you, pardon me, which stimulates uh, visual hallucinations and tactile hallucinations where you believe that there are bugs under your skin. If you, how many of you have known anybody who has a crystal meth problem? A couple of folks? No know that. Some of the folks that I've worked with who have crystal meth problems, it's very common for them to be constantly scratching themselves all the time. Um, in fact, uh, one individual who had contacted me and I worked with the parents for a while, um, this young lady had a hole literally in her head. She was going to her general practitioner consistently and the general practitioner was trying to treat her as if she had some sort of skin problem. But the problem wasn't skin uh, skin disease or skin disorder. The problem was she was addicted to stimulants and over time she got an ingrained psychosis that there were bugs growing in her skull. So literally she was scratching her way through her skull. Um, other folks will, will create huge scarred areas that never close because the person constantly is literally digging their fingers into their flesh. Um, the kinds of health problems that are created across the board are enormous. Furthermore, the other types of impacts which are listed here, in terms of marital impacts, when you think about the uh, likelihood of um, domestic violence, well over 60% of domestic violence cases involve some use of alcohol. And so it, it's pretty clear from the, the studies, and this is not to say that alcohol excuses domestic violence because there's never any excuse for domestic violence, and whether you're drunk or not, it's wrong. However, there's also a clear correlation between heavy drinking and domestic violence. So over 60% of the time, if somebody has, has become violent in their home, they're under the influence of alcohol, primarily. 
uh, and that is the chief culprit, in fact, in most domestic violence cases. In the area of child abuse, for children that are under 12 months, uh, again, over 60 or 70 percent of those cases where that's been reported, the person who is the perpetrator of the offense against an infant has been under the influence of alcohol. Um, the influence of alcohol and addictions on marital stability has been well documented. If you want to look at things that destabilize marriages, you look at a number of things. Three factors have been seen as strong precursors to the breakup of marriage. One of them would be uh, adultery and unfaithfulness. Uh, one of them would be the male's misuse of money, impulsive spending. But the third one, and a very robust one, is the place and a role of an addiction somewhere in that relationship. And if you have the, all three of those factors often go along with an addiction because an addicted person will often take money impulsively to pay for his or her habit. They'll often also act out sexually with other people, breaking their marriage vows. And then on top of it, they're obsessed with the addiction. That's a triple threat to any stability for marriage. And so if we, we begin to look at issues such as child abuse, we begin to look at issues such as family breakup, and we begin to see issues such as spousal abuse and domestic violence, we begin to see that the effects of addictions are powerful, and they're happening also not only in society at large, and not only in the homes as if they're over in the corner somewhere, but they're also affecting the church itself. Because if stable families aren't working in the church, then the, the congregation can't operate with the gifts of God that God has given them very well because uh, too many crises are going on for fires to be put out for people to grow into the maturity in Christ that God's got, them to, got for them to have. And so if we look at the impacts of individual marital and family issues, we also see that family structure gets undermined at least four ways. But typically, in an addicted family, the family has organized itself around the addict. If I had uh, four or five people here and we all represented a family together and we wanted to kind of represent an addictive system, and there's probably different ways to represent it, you'd put the addicted person in the middle, typically, and, and have everyone around him facing the center. Because when a person has an addiction, usually the family system has to adjust itself so it's centered and totally focused on the person with the problem. And so the folks around the edge, whether it be mother, father, siblings, whoever it is, they're constantly asking themselves, how can I protect this person? Or how can we keep them away from their substance? Or what can we do to stop them? Or how can we protect ourselves from them? And the result is everybody has spent a huge amount of attention in trying to organize their lives to deal with the one person who's got the problem. I can think of a, a family that came to me uh, who ran a family business, a construction business, and they, uh, they were a very strong church-going family. There were probably about five children in this family. And they called me up and they said, can you help us because we think one of our family members has a problem. And it was the youngest child in this family. And uh, this person was in their, their mid-20s, had never been able to hold a stable job except through the family business. And uh, they were concerned, particularly about his drinking, because he seemed to drink and drink and drink and be irresponsible. And they said, we've just had enough. So mom and dad came in with the four siblings, with some of the in-laws, and we chatted about what their family system looked like. I had them stand in a circle. I said, how would you, how would you arrange this system? Now, everybody was there, of course, except the fellow with the problem. They had all come to get help. But they made this kind of circle just as I've described. And they said, Joe, and that's not his real name, but we'll say it is, Joe's in the middle. And he, they, he, they said, all of us are facing him. Now, a couple of them were alienated, so they actually put themselves over in the corner. They felt cut off from the family because they had tried to confront Joe, and then other family members said, no, we have to just take care of Joe and keep him going. And so they felt excluded from the family because nobody would listen to them when they said there's a problem. And one of the things that I had to try and help that family do, and that you would do if you were assisting in that kind of case, is you have to try and figure out, first of all, how do you help Joe have a problem? Everybody else there seemed to have a problem, but actually they were taking on Joe's problem. And so we needed to talk together about how do you detach with love? How do you care for Joe 
But how do you start having him face consequences for his behavior and his actions? Because if you don't do that, the family will be running circles around itself focused on the other person's addiction. And they actually made some dramatic steps as a result. One of the great things about doing family work like that is for the first time, everybody sat around the table and they all heard the same information. Because one brother knew this about the situation, knew he came to work late all the time, and one sister saw him drunk on the floor at Thanksgiving, and mom had seen him in this case, and somebody else saw him drive drunk, and somebody else saw this, and somebody else saw the pot, and et cetera. And so that was encouraging because suddenly everybody knew the same thing. And they all knew one thing, and that was Joe had a problem. And their family system had actually been disturbed by the presence of an addicted loved one. A second thing that happens in this kind of case is role impact. And we, we have, a, uh, it, it's not necessarily uh, founded completely in research, but there's kind of standard wisdom that oftentimes if you have a, a, a parent in particular who has become addicted, other members in the family will take on particular roles sometimes to kind of compensate for the absence of that parent as they are, have checked out of things in the addiction. So you have oftentimes, not always, but sometimes you'll have one child who, who decides, well, my family's dysfunctional and dad is drunk all the time, so I've got to help mom, so I'm going to be the hero of the family. I'm going to make everybody proud. And I'm going to try and fix everything. And you might also have somebody who's, who's maybe one of the younger kids who feels there's a lot of chaos at home. They can't get along at all, and, or they don't know where they fit because there's no good parental guidance because in this case, if let's say mom is a responsible parent and dad's been irresponsible with an addiction. Mom's overwhelmed with all the responsibilities. She doesn't have much time to give that, that young child. So that child becomes kind of lost and doesn't really fit exactly, just checks out and goes to their room all the time, isn't, isn't part of things, and so on. There's another child that might come along. They might be the family clown. They might always, when things get hot and there's a, it looks like a fight's going to break out because somebody's been drinking heavily and they're going to start a fight in the house, they might come in and they might make a joke and, and, and try and lighten things up. And so they become, uh, th that's kind of their role in the family. So people begin to adopt these roles that they then take on into their adult lives, which they play out with, and maybe the roles don't work so good. But they learn them because they were organizing themselves around a dysfunctional system that was being affected by an addiction. A third uh, kind of area that families get um, switched around on for addictions is enabling behavior. And uh, I can think of a good example of that would be a family came in to me to talk about mom and one of the problems that mother had, she was in her 50s and she was a raving alcoholic. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a close friend or loved one that's had it. Any, anybody here ever have a close friend or loved one that's had a serious problem? Okay. Well, this, this lady would put them to shame. This lady came from a household where they, they made something like two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 a year. But in the last 10 years, she had been in the city detox about 12 times. I saw her when she had just gotten out of detox, two days. She's about 50 years old. Now, when she goes into detox, she becomes Mother Teresa, by the way, and saves everybody in the detox, and preaches, and she's clean, and she tells them about Jesus, and, you know, and then two days out of detox, she'd been drinking again when she came to see me. I worked with that family for uh, several weeks, and what became apparent that was, was rather sad was that her husband, who was a good person in many ways, could not set any boundaries with his beloved wife. He could not say to her, if you don't stop, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z. You know, or I cannot continue to support your behavior. You're killing yourself. I can't let my grandkids be with you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're dangerous to drive. You've lost your license. We have to watch you 24 hours a day. He could not stop enabling her. So enabling behavior is another one of the things that happens when people are afflicted with addictions and when you're related closely to somebody. It's sometimes hard to not want to help that person so much that you're helping them kill themselves. And so enabling factors end up crippling the family as well. And then lastly, I'll just mention that recovery can be stressful for families. In the midst of all the dysfunction that a family system endures, that also then plays out perhaps in relationships in the church and other kinds of, of areas as well. Um, if a person finally gets sobriety, 
the family system gets upset. It gets off kilter. The whole system's been used to an impaired parent, let's say, for example. And suddenly that impaired parent, who couldn't be trusted with a checkbook, and couldn't be left alone, and et cetera, et cetera, and has acted irresponsibly and angrily and so on, and everybody's had to kind of just put a compartment around that person because they weren't functioning. Suddenly they come back and they say, well, I've been, I haven't been drinking now for, for 30 days, and I, I want control of the bank accounts again. And I want to be in charge of the household. And I want the kids to respect me. And then the problem is, of course, for maybe for years, they have been mistreating the children or mistreating their spouse. And the family system is going to have to go through a, a real hard readjustment to get used to the idea that mom or dad are coming back into the picture and should be dealt with as an adult again. And that person's going to have to get used to the idea that it's going to take time for the family system to readjust. So we've talked about some health impacts and marital impacts, family structure impacts. Does the church have a problem with addictions? I'm stating that I think it's true, but um, what kind of problem do we think exists with addictions? And so let's just make a couple of comments about prevalence, first of all. Um, lifetime prevalence is one way that folks in the mental health field try to measure how big is a problem in society. And prevalence means how <clears throat> what's the percentage of the general population that will experience or qualify for a diagnosis during their lifetime. Incidents would look at how many people right now, if we took a sample right now in the population, have the problem. Um, prevalence would say, how many people might have this problem at some point? They might not have it all the time, but they might have it at some point. Well, prevalence for substance abuse problems, for example, and that's what I'll stick with uh, this evening, is not easy to nail down completely. But it's, it's likely, based on most of the studies as you, as you look at them, that it's somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the general population would at some point qualify for a substance abuse problem. Now, that doesn't mean they would qualify as addicted per se. They could be abusers which is a bit of a lower level. It's still problematic, but it's not the full meal deal. And so some, about almost 20% of the population could qualify for either substance abuse or substance dependent at some point in their lives. Now, it's a testimony to the fact that people are resilient and that people naturally sometimes pull out of addictions that we don't see that huge number of people develop chronic addictions, which seem to be almost... Uh, unbeatable, which leads people to lose everything. But still, when we be begin to see that if about 20% of people are going to have a diagnosable level of a problem, either abuse or dependence, at some point in their life, and then we think about the fact that all of that 20% are related to numbers of other people, we see that substance abuse not only is a serious problem for the individual, but is going to be connected to most of our families. I can, how many of you have a relative, if you sit here and think, how many of you have a relative you could identify, you say, yeah, I know, I've got somebody in my family system who's got a problem with drugs or alcohol or has? Raise your hand if you got, okay. Well, I think that pretty much says it right there. And so the prevalence is somewhere around there. At any one time, in terms of full-blown addiction, things like alcohol dependence, dependence on cocaine, uh, something along those lines, you'd probably find it closer to somewhere between 5 and 10% uh, at any one time, probably closer to 5% would really definitely qualify to be fully addicted to a substance of some sort. Now, there are three possibilities we would consider the question, does the church have a problem with addictions? And uh, the first one is, do we think that the church is worse off? And I mention this because to some degree in the field of psychology, there's been a, a bit of a history where organized religion and Christianity to some degree in particular has been pilloried as being kind of a hotbed of dysfunction. Um, we see this, uh, there's a great book by William Miller and um, a fellow named Delaney out of the University of New Mexico. Uh, it was published by uh, American Psychological Association Press, APA Press in 2005 on the Judeo-Christian tradition in psychology. I highly recommend that book if you're a uh, professional in the field. It's a fascinating study. But he talks about the kind of the critical rejection that historically has existed in psychology 
towards Christianity in particular and organized religion. You can go back and look at things like Freud's view was um, expressed in his book, uh, Religion, the Future of an Illusion. You can think about cognitive uh, therapy and Albert Ellis, uh, who's a guy that I've learned a lot from and I appreciate, but he's a doctrinaire atheist and uh, was quite negative towards organized religion and religious faith at some points in his uh, career and is a giant in the, in the field of cognitive psychology. There's been a real prejudice against uh, religion and spirituality. Now, some of that is being broken down now and has been for about the last 15 years. But what's happened is a shift that's only about spirituality has, it has come about, which is very positive, um, but there's still a fair amount of negativity towards religion. The truth of the matter is, interestingly enough, so when we talk about the issue of is uh, the church worse off than the rest of society, the truth of the matter is studies are showing repeatedly that religious involvement is a protective factor for a number of life problems. One of them is substance abuse. Religious involvement is a protective factor. Now, that's different than just asking people whether they have a belief in something. And that doesn't make much difference in any study. And that's why um, students of religious psychology don't ask that question if they want to find out if religious make, religion makes a difference. What they want to know is, how often do you attend church or religious services? Whether it be at a temple or a mosque or church. And pretty clearly for both adults and very strongly for young people as well, Folks who report that they attend religious services of any sort four times a month have anywhere between, say, four to five times less problems with substance abuse. So apparently involvement in a Christian community, not claims to be, have a belief, but actual involvement in religious community helps people have certain resources that gives them the ability, apparently, to have a lower risk at involvement in addictions. Now, that is not to say that we don't have addictions in the church. One of our struggles, of course, is that some folks who have addictions, or many folks who have addictions, their lives become so chaotic and unmanageable that they drop out of church. And so they're not as visible to us because they are no longer able to be involved because of the chaotic nature of their lifestyle. But in general, affiliation and actual, pardon me, not affiliation, but actual attendance at religious services is a prophylactic or protection for the development of addictions. So is the church worse off? Unlikely because of that factor. Is the church no different? I would say that the church is both no different and probably, though, potentially better off, but not scot-free. Virtually all the clients I've had who have been addicts and alcoholics for the last 10 years have been Christians. And so the answer is, I think the church is a tremendous resource to those questions that I raised. But yet, at the same time, we have failed many times to provide any answers for people who are seeking help with addictions. If you are a faithful church member and heavily involved, it's less likely you'll get involved in an addiction, but it's no guarantee. And when people do develop addictions within the Christian community, what help do we provide for them? And the answer is precious little. With the exception, I would say, of the area of addiction to pornography has become a major area of interest for churches, which I'm very thankful for. And probably, in many respects, the churches are way ahead of other resources that are available. There's been an organization called uh, Sex Addicts Anonymous and other related organizations for a number of years, 12-step groups. But there's a lot of strongly Christian self-help programs that have been developed and on the net resources that are exceptional in this area. And I've got some bibliography and other material to give you at one of our later lectures on some of those resources. So with the exception of recovery from pornography, where I think the church has done more of a job there, because in fact society as a whole doesn't even really recognize pornography addiction as a serious problem too much. It's seen as freedom of speech. It's seen as freedom of sexuality. 
and so therefore it's downplayed unless there's criminal activity involved. If we look uh, on the next page, page two, barriers to the pastoral care of addictions, there's a number of reasons why the church sometimes hasn't lived up to its potential. One of them is the tradition of revivalism and individualism. And revivalism, which is, uh, focuses strongly on an individual coming to, to a crisis moment with God and turning from darkness into light, just as Ephesians chapter 2 tells us happens when we uh, become Christians. Um, and this strong emphasis on the conversion experience has tended to make the, indiv- the, the Christian experience a, a, a strictly vertical and a very individualized um, item. The result is, is that when I have a problem and I go to my pastor, his, his way of thinking about problems has been molded by revivalism to kind of think only vertically about the problem. And so my pastor might tell me, well, the main problem is just in your relationship with the Lord. If I'm struggling with things like an addiction, that's not alone going to resolve my problem. Because an addiction is a holistic type of problem and malady that's going to require a holistic response. Now, that doesn't mean it's not all spiritual, because I think it is all spiritual, and we'll talk about that tomorrow particularly. But the legacy of revivalism, to some degree, has reinforced the idea of the individual's relationship with God is the only thing that counts. And therefore, looking at practical issues, like how does somebody plan for relapse prevention, or what do you do about compulsive cravings and thoughts like those? Well, if the answer is just pray about them only, the chances of a person beating the problem are going to be very severe. We're going to see a little bit later why that is. Because the problem of addiction goes deeper than merely just obedience individually to God. It also goes into every area of my life and how to rewire my brain as well as my thinking and as well as my actions. So revivalism and individualism has sometimes led us to overemphasize uh, kind of an individual relationship with God as the answer to everything when there actually are some more answers we've got to add to that. Uh, Secondly, a lack of biblical examples in Jesus' ministry. If you look at um, Jesus' ministry, we've cited it already today, but we don't see too many cases of chronic problems that he had to deal with. Almost in every case where we see Jesus working with folks, it's in an episodic manner. It's a one-time, one-off situation. He's encountering a leper. He's having a profound moment. He's talking to the woman at the well. It is a profound conversation. But there's no follow-up to that. We don't know about her struggles beyond that. And so because of that, we tend to think in terms of a cathartic one-time moment where a person turns around. Now, to be sure, when people recover from addictions, there are some of those moments. Those aha moments like, I've got a problem. That's when it hit me. Those are decisive, but even that is the beginning of a struggle, of a journey. It's not, bam, I got it, it's all fixed. In fact, if you're talking to somebody with an addiction and you have a great talk with them and there's some really, they, they, they're getting some insight and they say, okay, I know I've got it, you know, kind of thing. Well, you know what they're going to do. Is they, they go to, out the door and they say to themselves things like, okay, well, you, now I really get it. I know, I, you know what, I've been way off base. Now I can go back to use recreationally like I used to use because now I get it. I, I do have a problem, but I'm over it now pretty much and so on. So anybody who's worked with addicts has, has heard that kind of line. There's a lack of biblical examples of the long term sometimes, which the, the addiction uh, phenomenon challenges us about. There's also an emphasis on microwave spirituality that relates to that, where we really believe that things should just change overnight um, and that uh, the Christian life should be easy. And sometimes we don't talk enough in the church about struggle. And we don't make the church a safe place to struggle. I was just talking to... Um, a guy who, who called me up. I've known him for a number of years. And he called me up, and I was very honored because he said to me, I, he's just a friend of mine, but he said to me, John, you know, I've talked to you about problems in my marriage. He's in the ministry. And he said, uh, I wanted to talk to you because I'd like you to be accountable with me. And as we started chatting, he said, you know, I just got back from visiting Doug Weiss's uh, center in Colorado called Heart to Heart Ministries. Anybody ever hear of Doug Weiss or... Heart to Heart Ministry, some of you know it. And he said, uh, and then he began to open up his heart to me. 
And he, he regards himself as a sex addict. He's been addicted to pornography now for years and years. Never knew it. Um, good, good friend of mine. And uh, as we chatted and he began to kind of unburden himself and talk to me, um, you know, he, he just said, he said, I didn't know what to do with my addiction because everybody seemed to say, well, why don't you just repent of it and then it'll just be gone. And that's not how it works when you're struggling with an addiction. It just doesn't disappear so fast. And that kind of microwave expectation that everything's going to be turned around, uh, it, it requires more. Also, there's a lack of personal experience with addictions, number four on your page. Uh, many of you uh, may have nobody in your family that's close to you that's had an addiction. And you may yourself uh, may have had a certain uh, an existence where you haven't had a lot of close associates who, who drank heavily or used heavily. And so if you're a pastor or a lay leader, and some, or some of you may be grandparents of somebody who's got an addiction, but for you it's been hard because you have no reference point. I don't know what to do with somebody that's just got this kind of problem because I've never seen it before. And so that's another barrier sometimes. We don't know what to do because we haven't ever had any experience having to deal with the problem. Um, also, there's an abandonment of ministry sometimes, and this is not a negative comment about AA, but sometimes the church has said, well, we're just going to leave it to AA programs or we're going to leave it to social services or we're going to leave it to somebody else. And so we don't think of ourselves as a healing community anymore. We, we kind of say we're going to leave it to the professionals or we're going to leave it to the self-help folks and we don't think about, well, as a church ourselves, what can we do? Are there additional resources that we can think about doing? Can our pastor really lend a hand and be involved in a really meaningful way, um, even beyond those kinds of wonderful resources like AA? There's also a fear of failure. I think many times when we look at uh, addictions, we think to ourselves, I'm afraid to, to be involved with that person because you know what if God isn't enough? If I tell them they've, they've got to trust in God and God will help them and we'll try to work with them, but I know that there seems to be a high relapse rate and there's lots of failure and I don't want to fail and I don't want to make God look bad. You know, I've seen too many people really get up ahead of steam and be committed, it looks like, to sobriety and then fall away again and again and again. And it's so discouraging. So there's a fear of failure that sometimes interferes with us doing um, work with addictions. There's also confusion about the notions of sin, the disease model, and human responsibility. And we're going to talk some about that tomorrow. Uh, the, the title for the talk tomorrow is about the Bible and alcohol, a case study, but that's actually only a part of what we're going to talk about. Tomorrow night, we're going to deal particularly um, with not only the Bible and alcohol and look at that, but we're also going to look at questions related to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, the history of AA, the 12 steps themselves, and just kind of look at it with an appreciative uh, critique. We want to be very appreciative of the great contribution they have made. We also want to take a look at what are some of the objections to AA and what are ways that the Christian community can better support 12-step uh, ministry. We're going to look at also things such as the disease model and just kind of think about it a little bit from a standpoint of scientific research relating to the disease model um, and how it's useful and what are some parts of it that, that are not so useful and so on. And hopefully by the end of uh, tomorrow's time, we're also going to be looking at spiritual dynamics from a specifically Christian standpoint that you might want to keep in mind if you're working in a pastoral setting uh, with uh, folks who are struggling with drugs, alcohol, or other types of addictions. So those are some of the things that are coming up uh, as we go on. So we're going to hopefully, I'll either leave you more confused or, or less confused about send the disease model and human responsibility and, uh, and really the and 12 step programs. Um, and lastly, there's a the double seven there, a lack of pastoral training in helping people with addictions. Um, there was a consultation held in 2002 and then published in 2004 in Washington, D.C. of addiction specialists from all over North America. Uh, and they published 12 recommendations for pastors in the area of addictions. And what they did is they also conducted a survey at um, the Columbia earlier. In 2001, it was published out of Columbia University that surveyed all the seminaries in North America to find out what kind of provision for training they were giving pastors who were studying with them uh, in the area of addictions. And what they found in both cases was that there was very little training. Probably only about 10 or 12 percent of pastors have had any kind of training whatsoever 
on how to deal with substance abuse, for example. And so the fact that you guys are, are willing to host a conference and talk about addictions is an awesome thing for Acadia Divinity College. It's a really important area of pastoral care. Now let me just say when I'm saying that, I don't think that addictions are like the main thing that pastoral care is about. But if, if you're going to divide pastoral care into a number of, of very important issues, premarital counseling, for example, marriage enrichment and marriage promoting programs, um, helping strengthen parenting and so on. Certainly, addictions is one of these common, very common problems that family members in your church um, and their wider circles are dealing with. We've got to get the church more involved in how to help people with addictions because we really believe that Jesus wants us to reach out to the hopeless and the lost and the struggling, just as we've said. And so, um, this, I hope, will... Uh, include some of those 12 points that the consultation in D.C. in 2003 identified as absolutely critical to help pastors get better trained in the area of substance abuse counseling and crisis intervention. Now I'm going to catch my breath and I'm looking at my watch and we are now in defining addiction and we are now out of time for my presentation. Is that correct? I, I can go through? Okay, well, I will, I will run through this. Now we're going to talk about defining addiction, which I've been using repeatedly here. This is also in the middle of page two. An addiction is a biopsychosocial spiritual disorder, which is a relationship with a reinforcing substance or behavior marked by continued use despite negative consequences, psychological preoccupation, and failed attempts to stop using. Now there's tons of definitions. This is just one I'm using at this point. But this encapsulates pretty much common assumptions across the field about what's the nature of an addiction. Let me just mention a couple of points here. Uh, it's a relationship with a reinforcing substance or behavior. Um, nobody gets addicted to things that hurt them, typically, or are distasteful. Okay? Uh, you, you just don't get uh, addicted to penicillin, for example. It may upset your stomach some. Uh, for example, I don't get addicted to work exactly, although sometimes my wife has accused me of it um, because uh, work is, working hard is, is kind of grueling at times. It's, it's a little tougher to get addicted to it. It has its rewards. But in general, you want to get, uh, you get tied up in an addiction with something that really changes your mood and alters how you feel. And um, that's why substances are so powerful. That's why pornography is so powerful. That's why gambling is powerful. You stand in front of a VLT and you are visually stimulated and you believe that by putting more money into the VLT I can get a better result and I'm getting closer and closer to the jackpot. That feeds all the chemicals that are going inside your body and your brain. And it's very rewarding to believe that. It's also complete uh, baloney. But it keeps you going. And it's marked by continued use despite negative consequences. That's the hallmark of any addiction. Continued use despite negative consequences. Psychological preoccupation refers to craving and failed attempts to stop using, again, is a hallmark of an addictive situation. If you, can, if you can really stop using or doing something, then chances are you're probably not truly addicted. Um, I would add that the, uh, <coughs> the addiction continuum is probably a better way to look at things than the older way of looking at it, where it's you, you either are an addict or non-addict. If you look here on this page, it says the addiction continuum. And the old model there is that first line. It says non-addict or addict. And the idea was I could classify you as you're either in the club or you're outside the club. You're either in the problem or you're outside of the problem. In behavioral science in the last 15 years, it's become very clear that that's probably not the most accurate way to view problems with addictions. Instead, what you need to think about is addictions exist on a continuum. And people then have levels of severity along that continuum. It's not simply a yes or no. It's true when you get to the far end of the continuum, the dependence and addiction level, that's pretty clear. But some of the other places along the line are not quite so clear. And that's why um, if we would look at that uh, line at the bottom there, it says non-use, rare use, social use, abuse, and dependence and addiction. Uh, the DSM-4, uh, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for the American Psychiatric Association, um, has uh, produced several different criteria lists for both abuse and dependence on drugs and alcohol and other substances. If you turn to page 4 in your handout, you'll see that there's appendices there. 
The first section talks about the criteria for substance use disorders. You can look at that later. But you'll notice uh, at the middle of the page four, you have the DSM-4 criteria for substance abuse. And it defines it as a maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to clinically significant impairment. And then it describes it. To, get a, to, to meet the criteria for substance abuse according to this uh, diagnostic manual, which is widely used around the world, you actually only have to have one or two problems. So that's where that big category of 20%, a lot of them that we said in society will have some kind of problem in their life, so it might be falling mainly into this abuse category. Maybe they drove drunk a couple of times. Maybe they took some risks. Maybe they've gotten into trouble with, with uh, one substance or another. But it didn't turn into a life-dominating problem. They pulled away from it. It wasn't a pattern. Um, on page five, you see the criteria for substance dependence, which are much more thorough. And, <clears throat> and it means it's the same idea of a maladaptive pattern of use. And then it's defined by um, three or more in a 12-month period of the following ones. I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is kind of to help you think about if you were to try to say to yourself, how do I know somebody's got a problem with drugs or alcohol? And pretty much the category of addiction itself would overlap substantially with this diagnosis of substance dependence. Because um, it, it essentially says it's become more or less a life-dominating uh, phenomenon. And then if you look on the back of the next page, page six, the diagnostic criteria for pathological gambling. This is also from DSM-4 and shows you a sample of how to think about a behavioral addiction, such as gambling. And so there isn't uh, one of the comments I would make about these types of approaches to addiction. Um, for a long time, people said, well, addiction doesn't really exist unless you have physical dependence as evidenced by withdrawal and increased tolerance. You need more and more of the substance to get the same high. And if you didn't have those two criteria, you weren't really addicted. So that's why people said in the 70s, early 70s, cocaine wasn't addictive because they hadn't witnessed the, uh, particularly physical withdrawal from cocaine, which tends to be less physical than psychological. And now we've gotten away from that and we've said, no, wait a second. Instead of thinking in terms of just physical dependence dis dis uh, describing addiction, we see addiction as a holistic phenomena that happens to a person across many domains of their life experience and affects them deeply. And that's why when you look at pathological gambling, you are qualified for that diagnosis if you have five of these ten. You may not have some of them, but if you have up to five, you're regarded as a pathological gambler. And nowadays, addiction specialists are saying if you've got three of these ten, you're probably at risk for becoming a pathological gambler. So again, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a taste and understanding uh, and background in the world of addictions, some of the criteria from the DSM-4. The last page in your handout that we'll look at tonight as uh, time is uh, waning on us is page three. The mystery of addiction, why addictions are resistant to change. And uh, the first thing that I'm going to say, these are just ideas to use to think about addictions. Some of you have experience. We've got folks from our, our 12 group step network here. You've had lots of experience um, with addictions. Uh, some of you have no experience with addictions maybe, and you haven't really run into it. You're trying to figure out what you'll do uh, when you do. But one helpful way to look at an addiction, aside from all these technical definitions and so on, is to simply view addictions as a misplaced and misguided and harmful attachment. Attachment theory is, it's almost saying it's like a romance. A person falls in love with their addiction. And I would say to you that probably we fall in love with addictions is because God has made a vacuum in every human being's life for attachment, first with him and then often with a mate. That we, that's how we're formed. It kind of goes back to how God made human beings and mothers and kids and moms holding kids and feeding kids and that child learning what it means to be attached, close, cared for, safe, all those things. 
But in this fallen world we live in, many times that didn't happen because maybe the baby was born into a situation where the mother wasn't able to take what good care. And we all long for that closeness and attachment. It's part of how God made human family, culture, beings to work. What happens when you get involved in an addiction is it, be, it, ta- it, it, it goes right for that empty space that we have, for that attachment of closeness and intimacy. And it says to us, I'll be the friend that will never let you down. I'll make you feel secure. I'll make you feel safe. If you feel embarrassed in public, if you drink some, all that embarrassment goes away and you feel like the life of the party. If you're constantly self-conscious or worried about yourself, just snort some cocaine and I'll make you feel terrific. And it literally becomes, if you talk to many people with addictions, it will become like that, that deepest friend that they have. And one of the, the, the reasons that addictions are hard to get away from is because breaking up is hard to do. Now, isn't that true? Yeah. And when you think about the irrationality of addictions, how you see somebody going down the tubes or doing scary stuff, and you want to shake them, and you take them and you say, look what you're doing. How could you keep doing this? How can you throw your job away or throw your relationships away or throw your values away or throw your health away? And the moment you start arguing about against their addiction, what do they do? They'll defend their using and write you off. What does that remind you of? Do you ever have anybody in your life who was dating the wrong person? You know, they were going out with a bad guy, and you go to that that young lady and you say, don't go out with this guy. He's bad news. And what does your friend usually do right away? Defends them. It's the surest way to make sure they're glued together, right? But breaking up is hard to do because the attachment's formed. We form that attachment with a, an addiction, and it, it takes on meaning for us. It's not only about the chemicals. It takes on meaning for us. And so that's one of the reasons to help remind you why this isn't just such an easy thing to say, well, it's time to quit, which is what Lee's saying to me about my speech right now. Um, <laughs> It's one of the reasons why it's not so easy just to say no. Because breaking up is hard to do. And if you've ever, how many people have ever broken off a bad relationship? Okay, be honest. There's more of you than that out there. Sure. You've broken up a bad relationship, but did it just go away immediately when you, when you made that first step? Was it hard to make the break? Might have been tough. Might have been tough. You know what? You might have thought about that person for a long time afterwards. And you might have wondered, did I do the right thing? You know what? An addicted person, when they're trying to get away from their addiction, that's some of what it's like for them. There's a really great book called Drinking a Love Story by Carolyn Knapp. Anybody read that book? Some of you have read it. It's a great book, isn't it? She, She brings this out in spades. She talks about, this is an exact quote, but it's something like this, sitting at a restaurant, seeing a tall glass of white wine go by on a waiter's tray. And she said, it's like seeing a lover. It's like 10 ounces of liquid relief going by. It's like, but it's like seeing a long-lost lover suddenly on the street. And all the yearnings come up for me as it goes by. That really captures addiction as an attachment. A second thing about addictions that the mystery, why can't people get away from these things that are hurting them so much and hurting those who care about them so much, is uh, the idea of a neural highway might be helpful for you. When we um, use something that's highly rewarding and reinforcing, like masturbating to porn or playing those VLTs or smoking crack, It's not just the behavior externally that's happening, of putting the coin in the slot or turning on the screen or uh, taking the substance into our bodies, but it's also 
what's happening chemically in your brain as you repetitively do this. The forebrain is essentially the place where you make conscious, rational judgments. Okay? That's the thinking. That's the higher brain. That's what makes us different from the rest of God's creation. It has it to some degree, but nothing like the wonderful miracle of a human being made in God's image. When you take an addictive practice, behavior, substance, and repeatedly engage in it, it's like you're creating a highway that circumvents that frontal part of your brain and goes right to kind of the back side of your brain, the limbic system, and creates kind of an automatic highway. And so understanding why addictions aren't just so easy to snap out of is that if a person has done their behavior repeatedly or taken their substance over and over and over and over and over again, they're creating neural highways, if you would, pathways. They're creating extra receptors, probably, in their brain that are, that are going to crave the neurotransmitters that are manufactured through the processes of ingesting the substance. And so it's going to take a while, and you want to think about this analogy, what you have to do is two things. One is you have to help the person, or the person has to themselves, stop using those highways, because that maintains them, makes them even stronger, thicker, faster, and, and let them gradually fall into disuse. It's like an, the old wagon trail, a track somewhere that we have here in Nova Scotia from the great history of this side of the country, right? There's probably some lost tracks in the woods. Well, you want that to get overgrown. You don't want it to be like uh, Route 101. That's what it's like when it's being used for an addiction. You want it to fall back into the forest and grow over so you can't get down it very easy. And so you need it to go back into disuse and fade, but it's going to take time to do that, right? Because the road out there in the forest, that's an old historic road here, it took a lot of years. It took a while for it to go back to nature, didn't it? At the same time, you want to try to rebuild the highways that go back to your forebrain, that go back to that part of you that's, that's the true human part of you that makes conscious decisions as a choice maker made in God's image. And so that's a notion of the neural highway. And so it's understandable why it's difficult to quit. You've got the neural highway built right back to that limbic system, and you've got to disuse it and, and recreate and repair the uh, highways to the fore, forebrain that has gotten neglected. And then lastly, and we'll stop with this, and we'll come back and tomorrow uh, deal with this, this last one, but I would just say the longevity of associative learning. Um, I believe that uh, in general revelation, okay, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow, but um, associative learning is a process that God's given us to help us survive and thrive. It means uh, that, that some things, you were, when you were taking tests in school, you could remember what the answers were because when you saw the words that asked you about uh, the chemical problem or the English dictionary word or whatever it was, it, it triggered an association between what the word looked like and what you remembered in your head. And there was a connection there. And associations are really helpful to you. You couldn't drive a car very well if you didn't have association because the moment I sit in a car, what do you do the first thing you do when you sit down in the driver's seat? Yeah, you put your seatbelt on. That's associative learning. It, it's really handy because it's a shortcut. Do you, do you have to go and sit to the car and put your hands on the wheel and say, okay, what am I supposed to do now? You know? Now, when you first started driving, did you do that? Yes. When you first started driving, you, sat, you got in the car and you sat there and said, okay, what am I supposed to do now? You know, maybe some of you took a checklist or something about, maybe some of you are still doing this, but... Um, <laughs> When you first started driving, you had to pay close attention to everything you were doing. But as you become an experienced driver, it's automatic. You don't think about it. That's associative learning. It's very useful. It's how God given us a great gift so we can do all sorts of great things. Unfortunately, it also plays a role in addictions. It's, it's a misuse and distortion and corruption of something that's been God-given God ability we have. And so folks who are admired in an addiction have created all sorts of associations between using and various cues. It might be their feeling state. That's a cue, better use. I, I'm used to it. When I feel this way, I get high. It might be some thinking. 
okay, these thoughts, they lead me that way. It might be places. When I'm in this place, I want to use. One of the biggest cues I ever saw was a guy who was a Christian crack cocaine addict, and uh, he smoked crack down by the river in his car. He couldn't go back and forth to work in that car without being triggered. Associated learning was very strong. So one of the things we had to do early on in treatment was he gave his wife his old beat-up car, and he got to drive her brand new car. I, I know that sounds bad, but it, 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 actually, it actually broke the link that he had. It broke the link that he had. That's why when people have a collection of paraphernalia for smoking dope, you've got to get rid of it. And I'll tell you, that's hard for people because they have a lot invested in that romance. And there were a lot of good times, supposedly, their addiction tells them, about that pipe. But you've got to help them throw that pipe out because the associative learning is so strong that it, it circumvents the conscious brain and goes right to the behavior. And so breaking away from associative learning cues is a big task in recovery. And it takes time. It's, it takes some work. That's why it's not so easy just to say, I'm quitting. You've got to also break those down. Well, um, we have almost did most of what we were supposed to do tonight. I have uh, ascended greatly and will be chastised undoubtedly afterwards. Um, there's uh, numerous comments here. I will let uh, Craig come up and moderate whatever uh, closing moments we have given the lateness of the hour. We have time for a few uh, questions. And... Uh, just raise your hand and draw my attention and then stand up and make your question very clear for all of us to hear. Um, there's probably a number of things that you'd want to do on it, but one of the things you'd want to look at would be to, to and we're going to talk about this a little bit tomorrow, uh, is, is starting to begin to compare uh, addictive thinking with healthy thinking, and so and begin to replace and displace the addictive thinking, which kind of keeps that pathway there to some degree. Another thing you're doing is um, a false assumption has been developed by a person with an addiction usually that sees the addiction as the only reward that's worth having. And so by helping a person discover other rewards, you're creating some reward pathways back to the conscious brain that are positive and healthy. Um, so those might be some of the kinds of things that you, that you might try to, to work on. Again, uh, another, I know that, for example, Doug Weiss has done a lot of work with sexual addiction. Um, he, this is an old behaviorist technique, but he talks about putting a rubber band on a person's wrist. I don't know that this would be terribly successful with substance abusers, but it, it could be used. But in the case of folks who are obsessed with fantasy life, um, and he feels that uh, just using the old behavioral techniques, when you have the obsession come up around uh, the sexual fantasy, um, pulling the rubber band and snapping yourself. What he's trying to do is he says, uh, his, his claim is, he's trying to interrupt that old pathway, or the, the addictive pathway, to associate it with something negative instead of just associating it with masturbation and pleasure and so on. But try to make it say, youch, okay, when I go to that thought, that's not so, not completely pleasant anymore. So he's trying to weaken it that way. I don't know, those are some examples of, of things like that. Uh, let me just say that the, the neurological involvement in addictions is incredibly complex and are constantly changing uh, in, in terms of our understanding related to which particular neurotransmitters are involved with certain substances and, and how, how it all operates. It's, it's a real complex, multi-level analysis. So my neurological pathway is, is, if nothing else, is kind of a bit of an analogy to simplify some things just to think about it as much as anything else, too. Yeah. Well, as, as you well know, if you, are you involved with working with adolescents? Yes. Yeah. Um, the biggest problem you have up against uh, adolescents is they don't have much view of the long range. Um, it's it, lots of times. And so um, 
I would say that most of my work has not been with adolescents. It's been primarily with adults. Uh, I think it's important to, uh, this is just speaking from the experience I have had, one of the drawbacks sometimes with 12-step approaches with adolescents is because it looks to an adolescent like, okay, I'm, I'm 16, you say I have a drinking problem, so that means now I'm 16, and for the rest of my life I have to go to meetings. That, that may not be very appealing. And so you might want to add to 12-step interventions, other kinds of interventions that would also appeal to them, and that might also not be a lifetime involvement kind of a thing, which sounds overwhelming to them. Uh, sometimes. So I, you probably run, run into that uh, to some degree. Um, but you also have the problems with, it, with adolescents. Things like depression look different than they do for adults. And so it's important, uh, particularly for adolescent addicts, to, uh, you have to be cautious because sometimes uh, what can look like happiness or happy-go-luckiness, actually they could be very suicidal even uh, because depression manifests itself differently in adolescence than it does in adults. So I, that's probably not a whole lot of help, but yeah. One more question in the back. Go ahead.